Easter morning. Welcome to worship the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We begin our service with prayer. Heavenly Father, we have come to worship you. Draw near to us in your gracious word and assure us of your loving kindness. Curb our wandering thoughts that with undivided attention we may hear your voice and sing your praise. Amen. We continue with hymn 207, verses 1 through 4. We follow the order of service as it is printed in your bulletin and displayed by the projector. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from conception. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grant, we beseech you, Almighty God, that we who have celebrated the solemnities of the Lord's resurrection may, by the help of your grace, bring forth the fruits thereof in our life and conduct. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our Old Testament reading is found in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 6. This is a familiar reading from Advent, as the prophecy of John the Baptist occurs in it. We also have it today as a reminder of the need for the Savior to be announced and to come because all flesh is as grass, that we need the work of the Lord to uh, escape death permanently. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended 
that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The voice said, Cry out. And he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. Continue with reading responsibly Psalm 111. Praise the Lord, I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. In the assembly of the upright and in the congregations. The works of the Lord are great. Studied by all who have pleasure in them. His work is honorable and glorious. And his righteousness endures forever. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. He has given food to those who fear him. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. He has declared to his people the power of his works. In giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are verity and justice. All his precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever. He has sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding of all those who do his commandments. His grace endures forever. Our gospel reading is found in John chapter 12, verses 37 through 45. In order to truly hear and to believe the words um, of Isaiah, of all the prophets, and of Jesus himself, it takes the power of the Holy Spirit. It takes faith to be able to uh, see, hear, and know what is truth, and to see Jesus as the Son of God. But although he had done many signs before them, they did not believe in him that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts, and turn so that I should heal them. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Then Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. Blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. We now take the opportunity to confess with our mouth the belief that is in our hearts using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Continue with him 784. God's grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you in the name of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we consider the Word of God as it is written in the letter to the Romans, chapter 4, beginning with verse 23. Now it was not written for his sake, uh, that would be Abraham, not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, 
because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. In the name of Jesus, who lives triumphant from the grave, dear fellow redeemed. Although I was in my late 20s when I got my first pair of glasses, it was still a momentous occasion because of just how bad my vision had gotten. I remember distinctly driving back home uh, from the opto optometrist on uh, Highway 12 in South Dakota and being amazed looking out of the window and seeing individual stalks of wheat rather than just one big brown blur. I could see road signs again, read road signs again, which tells you how bad it had gotten. And I remember distinctly preaching that first Sunday with glasses, and I could actually see the expression on each person's face, which was something new to me too. Whether you put on prescription glasses, sunglasses, 3D glasses, there is going to be a difference in your vision. And it's also true that for each one of us, with or without glasses, has his or her own way of looking at things. Somebody who is a conspiracy theorist is paranoid and will see conspiracies everywhere. It's going to be through that filter and uh, every piece of news that that individual hears is going to be seen in light of a conspiracy. One who is pessimistic about everything can take even the greatest news and find something wrong with it. On the other hand, the optimist is said to see the world through rose-colored glasses, that no matter how bad the news is, the optimist will be able to find something good in it. Nothing looks bleak. As Christians, we have the privilege of looking at the world and events in this life through resurrection-colored glasses. In other words, we're be, we are able to see every event in this life from the perspective of and the comfort of Jesus' resurrection. This also changes our view of God. Because of the resurrection of Jesus and looking through those resurrection color glasses, God is not an angry judge to us, but a loving Father. Amazingly enough, God also can put on resurrection color glasses, that he looks at us through the resurrection of Jesus, and instead of seeing sinners that we are, he sees us as saints. May the Holy Spirit enrich us through a study of his word this morning. We all have a view of ourselves, but many times that view is not accurate. There is an old poem which concludes with the thought that it would be a gift to see ourselves as others see us. A person might think that he's very funny and gregarious, but others might see that person as being loud and obnoxious. Another may see himself as being shy and unassuming, but another person might look at that individual and come to the conclusion that he is uh, stuck up. But what about being able to see ourselves as God sees us? That very uh, element is presented to us in the Bible and it is dependent upon whether or not he is wearing resurrection color glasses. Or to put it another way, whether or not he is seeing us as being justified in his sight. That is to say, to be declared as not guilty. There can be no doubt about our guilt before God. The commandments of God clearly show us that he is insistent upon not only obedience with our bodies, but every thought in our mind, every inclination of our heart needs to be aligned with his will. What is wrong in the heart is a breaking of God's commandments, even if our bodies do not commit that particular sin. And that way, 
I could accurately say that today I am among thieves, murderers, and adulterers. It's also true that you're being addressed as one who is a thief, a murderer, and an adulterer. Nothing is hidden from God's sight as he would investigate our lives. No word or deed or thought will slip by his watchful eye. And so without resurrection color glasses, seeing a person who is not forgiven of his sins, God will come to the conclusion that person is only worthy of death and eternal condemnation. Well, when he sees us through the resurrection of Christ, he does not see even one single sin. He sees us as not guilty. He sees us as those who are clothed in a robe of righteousness, that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin and it looks at us and just sees saints, holy ones of God. Even though our sinful flesh is wreaking havoc in our lives, even though others may condemn us, even though our heart may condemn us, when God declares you to be not guilty, that is all that really matters. His rendering of this verdict of not guilty is good for all of eternity. The beginning of our text picks up on this train of thought concerning uh, one who is viewed as righteous when it talks about Abraham. In Genesis 15, God gives these, this promise to Abraham of a son, of the fact that uh, his descendants would inherit the land of Israel, and that all nations would be blessed through his seed. And we're told in Genesis 15 that Abraham believed and it was accounted to him for righteousness, that through faith, this is even before the law of God was given, before it could be obeyed or disobeyed. Through faith, Abraham was declared to be not guilty before God. We read in verse 23, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us, that is the righteousness of God, credited to our account, who believe in him, who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. It's very important for us to know this, that how God would end up declaring a person guilty or not guilty. It is through faith. The, the righteousness that Jesus won for the entire world, the forgiveness that Jesus was able to obtain on the cross, is only given to a person individually through faith. It is credited to your account in that way. In this way, God views you through the resurrection. The blessings of forgiveness do not belong to you. If you don't recognize Jesus as your Savior, you're not connected to him. But because Jesus, uh, we read in verse, verse 25, was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. The resurrection proves that you are forgiven. If you were not, Jesus would have remained in the tomb, but he was raised up because of our justification. There are changes that also occur when you view God through this resurrection of Christ. Without that view, you couldn't help but view God as unapproachable. You would see him as a ruthless dictator, one who is only there to dole out punishment because of sin. And how else could you look at him without knowing Jesus as your Savior? We have written our, in our hearts the law of God. We are given a conscience which declares us to be guilty when we commit certain actions. We would be the most delusional people in the world. And there are those who do not see God in this way, who do not know of Jesus and yet see God as some faceless, nameless deity who shut down their conscience, who 
uh, shut down the natural knowledge of God, who ignore the law written in their hearts. But deep down inside, the knowledge that God has embedded in us from birth on is clear. Sin equals punishment. But what about looking at the Lord through resurrection color glasses? Well, that changes everything. Now you know that your Lord loves you. You know that you have a relationship with him as a child to his father. We read in verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through, all, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. What a relief to know for a fact that your sins are forgiven. You not only have access, but you have peace with the creator of this world. The one who will determine your eternal destination is one whom you can call your father. You have a heavenly father who is able to help you in your time of need. Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how you can look at your Lord through resurrection color glasses. Those same glasses will make you view every event of this life differently as well. Being a child of God, you don't see random chance, but you see a plan. You have confidence that the Lord, is, uh, his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts higher than our thoughts, and he has a plan for you in this world. We don't see the vengeful hand of an angry God, but we see the compassionate, helping hand of a father. We don't see ourselves as being punished when things don't go our way in this life, when we have difficulties, but rather we see discipline with a purpose, that the Lord is teaching and guiding and directing us. We see death without its sting. We see life with meaning. We see it as an opportunity to glorify our Redeemer. With this resurrection vision, we also see tribulation as a chain, the beginning of a chain of events rather than a singular occurrence. Read in those last verses of our text, uh, verse 3. Not only that, but we also glory in tribulations knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now that's a view that you could not have without the resurrection of Christ. Most people will see tribulation as um, something that's just terrible, that there's no purpose to it, that we're just being smacked down. But if you cut out those middle words in uh, verse 3, you could come to the conclusion that tribulation in the end produces hope. There's a chain that goes with that, but that's the bottom line. Tribulation produces hope. In times of tribulation, and that is one of my favorite words because of the descriptive nature of it, tribulation is like being squeezed in a vice, and we all know how that feels, like when you're just being pressured and it's causing all sorts of problems in your lives. It, without resur we're, we're tempted at that time to take off our resurrection colored glasses and feel sorry for ourselves because we're having problems. We may want to blame God for the problems that we're enduring. Then you have to go back to that crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. And in that perspective, you know that God is not intending to crush you, but actually refining you, strengthening you, changing your vision, because tribulation produces perseverance. That is the ability to endure. You're getting stronger. Perseverance produces character. That is uh, the ability to stand as one who is improved, passing the test. And character produces hope. Through tribulation, then, 
uh, viewed in the correct way, you're going to be even more hopeful. You'll rely more and more upon your Savior and see hope through this life and into the life to come. Uh, verse 5, Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has given to us. We've all been disappointed in this life. We may take a vacation somewhere and, and have that all, uh, that uh, sight all built up in our minds. You know, we think this is going to be a great thing. And it maybe does not live up to our expectations. And that's true with many, many things in this life. That what we imagine something to be is not there. And the hope that we have disappoints. Not true with the Christian. You will never let, be let down in your hope of an eternal home. You're not going to get to heaven and say, is that all there is? And look forward or uh, want to be somewhere else. Heaven is going to be beyond any expectation that we could have. Hope does not disappoint. This life on earth does not need to disappoint either because we're told the love of the Holy Spirit has been poured out in our hearts. Notice what it says. You're not just given a few drops by the Holy Spirit. You're giving, you're, is being poured out in you, given to you in abundance. And even in this life, you can be overwhelmed and amazed at the love of God and the goodness of your God. I don't think anybody's life has turned out exactly how they expected and exactly how they planned it. If that were the case, I'd be coming off a Major League Baseball career. That was a nice plan. But we all have different things that we expect. Even a month, even five years in the future, we have these expectations and often we're disappointed. But you can rest assured that one thing in your life has occurred that makes it worthwhile. God has sought you out, found you, and made you his own. He justified you, declared you to be not guilty, and because of that sees you in the best light possible. He sees you through resurrection color glasses. Your view from those same glasses is fantastic as well. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will give you hope and peace. Amen.
O God of all grace, mercy, and peace, by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, you declared him to be your Son and our Savior. By the faithful testimony of the apostles, you have given us the confidence that our faith stands upon a most true and sure record. Grant to us the daily power of your Holy Spirit through your word of truth, that our hearts may always rest on your sure promises. May our hearts move our hearts to daily desire the pure teaching and refreshing comfort of your word. Help us always to find Jesus in them with eyes of faith. Though we do not yet see him personally, lead us to love him more and more with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the goal of our faith, the salvation of our souls. Dear Lord, you know all the desires and needs in each heart. Give your loving attention to the supplications that arise to you from each believer. And if in your wisdom you have permitted a cross of trouble or sorrow to come into our lives, give us the confidence that you will not permit us to be tested beyond our ability, but that you show us the way of escape, that we may be able to bear it. Grant to all your people daily repentance and the full assurance of forgiveness in Christ. Strengthen the doubting and those who are weak in faith. Bring back the forgetful and the wayward and comfort the anxious and distressed. And as we go from this blessed place today, grant us your peace. All this we pray in the name of Christ our Lord, who also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please rise. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. We conclude our service today with the fourth verse of hymn 209. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Pastor Sowers will be returning from vacation. Uh, do you want know what date it is? I mean, th sometime this week. And uh, I don't have any announcements from him other than what's in the bulletin. Are there any other announcements? May God keep you in his grace throughout the week.